be moderating. My name is Kathleen Hall Jamison. I'm director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Our topic today is covering science, assessing and representing uncertainty, credibility, and reform. We're going to be focusing largely on COVID-19 and the challenges involved in presenting and in covering particularly emergent science in the context of a pandemic. We have three distinguished panelists. I know that you know them by their reputation. Uh, we have Christy Oshwander, we have Manya Baker, and we have Richard Harris. I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about Christy. She's going to then give a brief presentation of the things she wants you to focus on, things that she thinks are most important. Then we're gonna to go to Manya, and then we're gonna to go to Richard. Uh, Christy Oshwander is an award-winning journalist and author of the New York Times bestseller, Good to Go, what an athlete and all of us can learn from the strange science of recovery. It begins with a study about beer and running to examine the ways that science can come to erroneous conclusions. Previously, she was the lead writer, lead science writer at 538. She's written about COVID-19 for Wired, The Washington Post, Scientific American, Elemental, Kaiser Health News, and Nature. Christy, take it away. Thanks, Kathleen. I appreciate it. Um, COVID-19 was a really interesting uh, experience, I think, for journalists and probably for scientists, too. This was a moment that really forced the public to reckon with uncertainty in a really explicit way and in a way that I think they don't normally, you know, the, the sort of process of science is not normally so front and center in the public's eye. Um, you know, if you had told me a year and a half ago that uh, R naught or herd immunity or some of these things flatten the curve, does everyone remember that? Yeah, these terms that at one point seemed very jargony and scientific would, would enter the public lexicon, you know, I would have laughed, of course. We've learned in the last few years that a lot of things that used to seem unthinkable have come to pass. Uh, but anyway, COVID really brought uncertainty to the forefront. And uncertainty is something that I have thought a lot about um, as a journalist, even before COVID. And in fact, I'm currently noodling around with a writing project about uncertainty in science. So I would love to hear from any uh, people in attendance here, people that have ideas around this, would love to hear from you because I'm collecting string for a new project about this. But I think that, that what COVID really did was it helped um, show that society's expectation of science really framed the way um, a lot of the things about COVID were, were talked about. There was a lot of fear driving the messaging. People really wanted to know what to do. Um, and there, there was just this demand for black and white answers. And this really creates a problem for scientists, but also for journalists like me who need to present this really pretty nuanced and complex information to the public. Um, you know, you want to maintain your credibility. Um, you know, this, this is something that happened with scientists, but I think also with journalists, you know, I wrote early in the pandemic that, you know, at that time, masks were not being recommended. The best evidence that we had and sort of putting all of the information about what was going on at that point in time, masks didn't seem like the thing that we wanted people to go out and rush to get, particularly when we were concerned about supplies and things like that. Now that, that answer changed over time, and this creates sort of um, confusion among the public who's feeling like, wait a second, I thought science was really certain. I thought that science created black and white answers. Yeah, I think that there's this idea among the public that you know, things are either true or they're false and that a study proves something. And I think everyone probably in attendance here today knows that science doesn't work that way. Science is a process, it's not an answer. And every, every answer that science does produce is provisional. And this is really important to grasp. And I think that we've just really done a poor job of explaining this to the public. And in part, it's just a really hard lesson to grasp, I think. Um, so often the way that science gets presented to the general public is that, I mean, there's even memes that say this, science says, or because science. And so we really, they get, they get an idea that science is very certain and that it's, it's final. And so when things change and these provisional answers get adjusted and um, you know, your, your priors are updated and all of that, it can feel like a betrayal and it can feel like, oh wait, science isn't as credible as I thought it was. And so one thing I've really been aiming to do, and I'm not sure that I've, I've succeeded frankly, because this is a really hard problem, but I've really tried to get in my stories, this idea that uh, this uncertainty exists and that it's an important part of this process and that whatever I'm telling you now and whatever we know right now is subject to new information and new studies and new data. Um, 
you know, early in the pandemic, there was this rush to figure out what to do and everyone wanted answers and there was a lot of fear. And so it was like, oh my God, what do I do? And the problem here, right, is that the scientific answers to all of the questions that people had almost always contain some sort of version of it depends or we're not sure. And this is hard, you know, and at the same time, then you have these doubt purveyors and, and uh, people with vested interests who are offering certainty. And so they were offering these hard and fast answers and that's really hard to compete against. And I think it's hard to explain to people who are scared, who don't know what to do, who want to protect themselves, protect their families. And uh, I'm saying that, well, this is really complicated and we're really not sure right now. I can't tell you exactly what to do. Here are some options. Meanwhile, there's this other guy saying, this is exactly what you need to know. Here are the hard and fast answers. Trust me. And I think that what really happened here is we saw sort of a, a a lapse in trust here, both of scientists and in journalists. And some of this obviously was pushed by politicians. Um, yeah, but there was also a big rush in the early days to do fast science and to get quick answers. Um, and, you know, here again, we got some, some answers that, you know, were very clearly wrong. I'm thinking, for instance, of some of those early antibody studies. I think Stephanie Lee at BuzzFeed did some really good reporting showing some of the shortcomings of those studies, but you sort of had this herky jerk where you know even credentialed experts were saying very different things and the public really didn't know what to believe, um, especially when a lot of it seems to be coming from credible, credible sources. Um, yeah, and this just made my job really hard because you know we're being flooded with crap and I worry that this, undermines the scientific enterprise. You know, what the public sees isn't that science is hard and this problem is especially so. What they see is that there are all these conflicting studies and scientists are fighting. And so I've been doing a lot of thinking about, you know, how do I convey that to the public and show that, well, the fact that, that scientists are arguing about this or discussing it or, or, you know, discussing possible shortcomings, that's actually good and that's science working as it should. And uh, you know, in the meantime, we need to give you some provisional answers, but just understand that they're up, up for change. And that's been hard to do. Um, back in April of 2020, I wrote a piece for Wired that was arguing um, really that during the pandemic, rather than lowering the standards for science, we actually need to raise the bar. And you know, we were getting a lot of these cases of fast, sloppy science, when what we really needed was more deliberate and careful science. Um, yeah, we had all hands on deck. So, you know, presumably this is possible. And there are instances where people really did come together and do some pretty extraordinary large projects. I mean, I think the vaccines themselves are a fantastic example of this. Um, but at the same time, you had a lot of uh, fast studies coming out that were getting criticized a lot, and that's good. Um, but it makes it hard from a public messaging perspective. You know, and, and, you know, when getting at the, at the truth is at a premium, I think we really need to employ our best tools and methodologies and not relax, relax our standards and let any, anything go. And yet we were seeing that. And so my job as a journalist was really made hard because all of a sudden I'm just talking all nuance all the time while meanwhile I'm competing with these folks who are putting out these messages that everything's really simple, it's black and white, here are the answers. It, and it's just been sort of an ongoing issue. Um, I read another story for Nature, which is about the problems with herd immunity and this herd immunity approach that at that time was being championed by some people within the Trump administration. Here again, it was a really complicated story. And I think, you know, a lot of people in the public have been hearing about herd immunity in the context of vaccines. And it can be difficult to explain, you know, the difference between herd immunity via vaccine versus um, actually contracting COVID. And this was just something I actually, just this morning got a text from a friend asking me to, to explain this and saying, well, wait, you know, I was just at my running club last night and someone was saying that everyone's going to get this and aren't we just going to get it and isn't herd immunity how we're going to get out of it? And, you know, I said, I don't have an answer that I can text to you with my thumbs. Like this is, I can send you some articles I've written, but, but the nuance here is, is really complex and this makes it really difficult. Um, to explain to the public. Um, the last story that I want to tell you about really quickly is I wrote a story for Scientific American that was debunking sort of these false claims that continue to this day, unbelievably, um, that COVID death counts are really inflated, that really people aren't really dying of COVID, that this is all invented and people are just saying this to make money or things like this. And this is something that I thought was kind of an interesting um, exercise because really what we have here is something that we cannot be absolutely 
certain about. We will probably never know the exact number of people who died of COVID. At the same time, we have three separate lines of evidence that point to the same answer. So we can't know the exact number. And yet at the same time, we can be quite certain that there are you know, of the order of magnitude and that in fact, there are many, many people dying of this dreaded disease. And so, yeah, this was a story that I, I, I took this approach of trying to kind of show the certainty within the uncertainty. And again, you know, it felt sometimes like I was preaching to the choir. I actually have some members of my extended family. My dad had sent this story to them um, because they were of the mind that this wasn't important and, you know, it didn't convince them. And, uh, you know, up until now they had considered me credible. So I don't know what the answer is, except that it's clear to me that uncertainty is really difficult. Uh, for all of us to deal with. I mean, I find it difficult in my personal life. I think all of us who've been living through the pandemic have had to deal with a lot of uncertainty and it, it, makes, it makes it hard for us to interpret things. It makes us um, very prone to wanting to jump to comforting answers or answers that seem very certain, even if we know that that certainty isn't there. Um, and then I'll just really quickly close out and hand it over to Mania, but I wanted to just point to a story that I wrote for 538. This was long before the pandemic. Um, the title was, There's No Such Thing as Sound Science. And this was a story about how um, some of the tools and language of open science are being used and sort of weaponized against science. And uh, if you're interested in this, I think this is something that we really have seen in COVID where we're seeing people, um, you know, vested interests trying to undermine good science by saying that, you know, the, the data aren't vigorous or so we, we don't see all of, all of the data aren't open, things like this, but really sort of nitpicking and using the language of, of open science and sort of the, the open science, meta science movement. Um, so anyway, I feel like I've been talking for a while, so I will hand it over to Manya. And I'm in charge of doing an introduction for Manya, which is my pleasure. Manya Baker commissions and edits articles on improving science for Nature Magazine, where she's worked since 2007. Her work has appeared in Nature, Science, Wired, The Economist, Slate, New Science, and a lot of other places. Manya, it's your turn. Thank you so much. I'm really, really excited to be here. And um, I'd just like to say that um, I'm, I'm really hoping to uh, leave this session uh, smarter than I started. So I'm hoping that there will be a lot of debate and challenge and, and good questions. So um, since I um, really don't do much journalism uh, these days, my focus is going to be um, different from what Christy and Richard talk about. Um, I bring in articles um, that I commission from scientists, and I'm going to talk about a how uh, people, how how my authors can represent themselves uh, more credibly and and, and convey uncertainty, um, and I think um, the one thing that really surprised me when I started the job was how careless uh, researchers could be about facts outside their discipline. They might be super meticulous about their own research or about their own field, and then they'll get things like um, leading causes of disease or when a, re a when a NIH institute started, they'll get these simple facts, simple common facts wrong. And um, that undermines credibility. Um, we save them because we have a lot of fact checking um, at Nature, but it, it definitely um, makes me less willing to commission someone again when um, I get something with simple, simple facts. Um, and that happens a lot. Um, something else to boost credibility is to acknowledge critics and limitations. And I am almost always having to ask my authors to add a paragraph acknowledging and explaining their critics um, to and and that's really important because when you when you see that someone else understands um, critic the criticism levied at their work you tr you trust you um, you trust their their judgment and their their um, critical reasoning um, more thoroughly um, something that's uh, more important but uh, well uh, but um or at least harder to explain is sort of pricking the right frame for the argument. Um, I, I, it's important to not pick absolutist or semantic arguments, but sort of a practical argument, the argument that is 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 going to be what people make decisions on. So um, instead of saying, vac arguing vaccines are safe, a better argument is, 
it is safer to be vaccinated than unvaccinated. If you try to argue vaccines are safe, you're going to get into this like useless whirlpool of defining safe and open yourself up to um, um, to petty arguments where um, it's safer to be vaccinated than unvaccinated can keep you focused on the uh, evidence evidence that really matters matters practically. Um, and then the for credibility, the last thing I'll say is show your human side. I, I can't believe I'm still saying this 25 years after Carl Sagan died. But I, I remember um, when I was a pretty new as a journalist, I was reporting about dodgy stem cell clinics that um, were, were advertising um, therapies that really had no evidence that they worked and didn't have great safety oversight either. So one um, scientist I interviewed said to me, oh, I think this is really scary. And then we talked a long time about um, about more technical things. Um, the quote I used was, honestly, I think this is really scary. And she called me. She was super angry that I had quoted her as a scientist expressing emotion. And um, I spent a lot of time on the phone with her explaining that, you know, I could probably get to the technical things as, as, as well as she could, but the, this kind of um, um, overall ex expert assessment that, that elicited a visceral reaction, that was the kind of thing that people could connect to, that they could, that was the indication that this kind of thing mattered. Um, but I still have to ask multiple times for, for my authors to um, say, this frustrated me, or this gives me hope, or those kinds of, of things, because it's, it's, um, it's the emotions, it's the things that matter to us that make us, make us um, read, read an article. Um, and 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 want to and and care about what it says. Um, I think it's also really important to think about where your audience is coming from and to show where you are coming from. Um, before I I went into um, science science editing and and journalism, I was a high school teacher. I was a high school teacher at a low income school, uh, um, um, in a low low income community of color, and I had met this. Um, Black geology professor and invited her to come to my class and I, I, I didn't uh, I didn't tell my students that she was a woman and I didn't tell them that she was black I just said Professor White is coming to talk to you and Professor White knows how to talk to college students and you need she's not you I didn't say she, um and and Professor White is needs to be impressed with you even though you're high school students. And she, you know, she walks into the room and somebody says, oh, someone's mom's here. Like somebody asked that actually asked her whose mom she was. And she walks up to my classroom and I'm like, Professor White, and all their jaws are dropping, dropping, dropping. And um, and and so they're 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 ready, they're ready to hear her. And then she gives the slide pre presentation of how she she um spends lives for weeks at a time on a research vessel in this teeny tiny room because she cares about what the secrets um uh, what that you can learn from sea, sea sediments. Now, my students don't really care about sea sediments. They don't really care about geology, but because, because this, you know, wealthy professor that looks like them cares about it, they start caring about that. So if, if that's the kind of thing that's in your background, if you can connect with your audience some way, um, use, use that. Um, if, if, um, if, I, when when somebody can explain, I am interested in this question because it touches me in this way or that way, in this way or that way, or I care about this so much that I live on a boat. Um, um, those kinds of things do bring credibility because because your audience knows that you've made a personal investment, even even if your audience is fellow researchers, as you know, the people who who read Nature. Um, I want to go really quickly through. Um, um, ways to convey certainty as authors. Um, I would say that um, unless you have been touched by the gods with explanatory powers, or uh, you're working with a really, really great infographics person who sort of gets gets statistics, I'd stay away from um, from the more technical descriptions of statistics. I would look for comparisons. I would look for, um, we are as certain of this as we are about evolution. We are as certain of this as we are that this microbe causes that disease. We are as certain of this as we are that bacon causes colon cancer. You know, like, right, the last one is less certain. Um, so, so try to find, find um, sort of tie certainty to more, more practical considerations. Um, and uh, also, if, if there's a behavioral change that you've made because of your research, again, show your human side, say, you know, because of this, I, 
um, I am eating outside in restaurants. Um, because of this, I made the first appointment to get vaccinated. W whatever it is, if, 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 if your research has led to a behavioral change, that's one way to convey how certain you are and how sort of you're analyzing risk. And it shows, you, it, it shows that you're a human being trying to figure out um, a question. And I think that when science is represented as humans trying to figure things out, um, people are much more understanding when the knowledge changes. Um, so that's, um, those, are, those are my thoughts. I'd, I'd love to hear, hear feedback and I'm, I'm really interested in the rest of this panel. Thank you, Manya. At, we're now going to turn to Richard Harris, who's covered science, medicine, and the environment at National Public Radio for 35 years. In June of this year, he stepped away from that role, and he's now on an indefinite break from science journalism. He's author of the 2017 book, Rigor Mortis, which explores the issues of rigor and reproducibility in biomedical research. Richard, your turn. Thanks so much. And uh, uh, I think uh, that Christy and I shared a lot of common experiences in dealing with uncertainty around uh, around uh, this topic of, of COVID-19. So I'll just uh, fill in a couple of other uh, uh, elements of that that, uh, that you touched on, but didn't maybe underline, which is basically uh, it, it, in general, we in the world uh, uh, expect when there's a big disaster, health, public health disaster, we turn to uh, the scientists at the NIH and the CDC uh, and uh, the federal scientists, we expect them to be sort of the voice of great knowledge and reason. And one reason they've developed credibility over the years, in my view, is that they have generally been very good about saying, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, here's where we're going. Now, as Christy mentioned, uh, very often news organizations may uh, 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 cut short the discussion of what's unknown because the, a lot of editors say what we really need to do is give people practical, actionable advice right now. So forget about what's not known. Let's let's talk about let's let's treat things with certainty, and and that sort of is uh, part of human nature that gets us into trouble here. But those scientists generally are aware when they're in that situation. Uh, uh, Tony Fauci being an, an excellent example of this uh, to to underscore, you know, the, here's things we don't know. Uh, of course, with COVID nineteen, uh, that whole system got pretty badly messed up through politics because it wasn't just the scientists, it was the White House, it was the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, who were basically trying to spin things uh, for political reasons. And of course, trying to deal with President Trump who uh, had a very free flowing uh, connection with reality. And, uh, and I've spent many, many evenings covering live White House press conferences uh, where, you know, part of our job was just simply to try to keep track of all the things that were being said that were that were blatantly wrong and trying to bring at least some of those to the attention of my audience and say, well, you heard that, but that's not so and so on. Um, but uh, obviously the scientists themselves were in a pickle because they were often standing up there next to the president when he was saying, well, maybe we should inject people with bleach. And, uh, and, uh, and they, uh, sometimes felt like they weren't in a position to say that's ludicrous. Uh, and so we were dealing with not only uncertainty, but this gets down to the issue of credibility uh, because the scientists themselves, you know, had to choose. I mean, if I, if I get too, if I go too far out there, I'll be cut out of this whole picture. But on the other hand, I'm losing my credibility by standing here next to somebody who's spouting things that are, that are simply not true. So it was a really uh, interesting and often painful dynamic to, to witness and to participate in. I will say ultimately NPR uh, realized that we were not serving our public by um, actually broadcasting these crazy events live and so uh, so we stopped covering them live uh, and then we but we you know we obviously felt an obligation to report what was said afterwards but then that way we can contextualize it much better but uh, but many other people just got these live streams through cable TV and so on and so uh, there was no really good way for them to to sort fact from from fancy uh, in in covid 19 and that was that's you know that's it was a crazy situation uh, I remember, uh, when Tony Fauci showed up at the White House in the first briefing uh, for the new administration, he just basically, <laughs> figuratively speaking, wiped his brow and said, you know, it's such a relief that I can now just speak my mind. I mean, he always did fairly well, but, uh, uh, but he was, but he, you could tell he was self-censoring a fair amount as well. So, 
So that's, you know, I think it's important to remember the context in which the science is flowing. And in this case, that was, it was a very uh, difficult dynamic, both for, for journalists as well as the public to try to, to suffer through. Um, I, I'll just, uh, uh, I guess that touches on not only uh, uncertainty, but also to, to a certain degree, credibility, which is one of the buzzwords in our title. Um, let me take a few minutes maybe to talk about uh, one issue that really got surfaced as a result of COVID-19, co coincidentally, uh, uh, you know, preprints were just starting to take off as COVID uh, hit the stage. And, and, uh, and we as journalists have been thinking quite a bit about how are we going to deal with preprints? They're not peer reviewed. On the other hand, peer review is not always that great anyway. Uh, what are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this flow of information? Uh, and it quickly turned from a sort of theoretical, you know, once in a while we'll reference a, uh, 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 a preprint to a situation where we were dealing with them all the time. And, uh, and I think that's an, that's a, that's an unfinished story for, for sure. And I'm interested in talking to Christy and Manya and, and Kathleen and others who are interested in this session about, uh, about what journalists can and should do around the issue of preprints. But let me give um, just a, one or two quick examples. Uh, one of the stories that uh, I have been tracking as a journalist uh, was uh, the story about this drug called ivermectin, which is actually a human drug made by Merck for human treatment of parasitic worms. And uh, more than uh, er, fairly early on in the epidemic, uh, somebody thought uh, of tossing it into a petri dish with uh, the uh, coronavirus that causes COVID-19, and they discovered that at sufficiently high doses, and these were actually very high doses, uh, the, uh, this, this anti-worm medication actually did kill the virus. And this got a bunch of scientists interested in, uh, in thinking, well, you know, added it to the actually quite long list of, of drugs that thought could be used or repurposed to treat COVID-19. It never struck me as being a particularly likely one to succeed, and there were many others uh, uh, like it, but I kept an eye on it. And, um, and there was a preprint in uh, the beginning of the about a, beginning of this year, I guess it would looked did a meta analysis of the first five human studies of this and basically said, eh, doesn't really seem to work very much. Uh, but uh, so I was I had decided I wasn't going to cover it. There's always a risk for journalists if you cover a story like this, even if you say, ah, this drug is not likely to work. You know, most people will uh, are likely to agree with that, but some people will say, oh, wait a minute, a new drug that might work. It might work if, if you know, why not try it? And of course, people are trying it in a uh, these days are trying it in the veterinary form because Merck, the manufacturer, was sure enough that it was unlikely to be successful in, in COVID-19, that they basically restricted access to the human form of the drug. So people are picking up the horse form, uh, uh, which is, uh, and diluting it or whatever, uh, guessing the correct dosage. So, but at any rate, so, um, but it was one of these things that uh, uh, started to snowball this year because people uh, who, you know, chose not to believe sort of the the mainstream science around COVID, uh, alternative medicine people and people with political motivations and so on, or views, uh, started really using this and promoting it and pushing it and claiming that this was being suppressed and this and that and the other. So at, so at some point, uh, this, is also, this is also a story that reminds us that journalists are no longer the great gate gatekeepers we were, uh, if I decide not to cover it and my pals at the New York Times and the Washington Post and everybody else, sort of mainstream science journalism decides not to give this any ink, uh, it will still take off because people are talking about it on Twitter. People themselves are reading the, the preprints or their, their friends are, or scientists are advocating these points of view are promoting these things and they're spreading it on Twitter. So, so it's, a, it's a real conundrum to um, how to deal with this information, what role journalists can and should be playing these days in trying to manage the flow of information that we believe to be wrong. We don't want to give air unnecessarily to, to, you know, pr to promulgate bad ideas. But on the other hand, at some point, we have to decide to step in if it does take off, as this one did, and say, okay, here's the deal. This isn't really, uh, here's what the evidence is, and it's not, it's not that strong. Uh, and, uh, and my take on it really was I was waiting for much more definitive studies. And I kept telling people were pestering me to cover it. And I kept saying, well, you know, if I see a really good s s study that's convincing that shows that this has an effect, I of course will report on it. But right now it's just, it's in that big hopper of dozens of other drugs that people are, are fiddling around with and hoping are going to be the big, uh, 
the, the silver bullet or whatever, or at least an, an effective medication against COVID. So, um, so this is, uh, this is partly an, a function of preprints and how fast information was flowing out and how readily somebody's small and interesting idea about, you know, let's try this in the test tube and see how it happens, how quickly that was able to mushroom and become a, uh, sort of go, to, go into the public eye. And uh, um, so, so and, well, I, uh, so, so I think I, I had another anecdote, but I'm also running out of time. So maybe we can we can come up with that uh, as the discussion progresses. I guess maybe this is also uh, for left, best left for the discussion, sort of the issue of reform. I know people have been thinking a lot about preprints, but I'm not convinced that dealing in any substantive way with preprints is going to solve the kind of problems that I was just discussing. But uh, but. Uh, uh, it's it's a point of for me it's a point of interesting discussion not not that I've made up my mind around that topic so Kathleen I'll, I will uh, turn this back to you to open our our broader conversation. Thank you all. Uh, our format is going to be to spend about the next twenty eight minutes uh, engaging the panels ask the panelists to engage each other and then we're going to turn to Q and A. Those of you who'd like to start putting questions in the question box I see they're beginning to to aggregate I'll turn to them at approximately four o'clock. Uh, let me start with a big question. Uh, we, we now are in an environment in which there are in some quarters sustained attacks on the credibility of public health agencies, hence what we used to think of as custodians of scientific knowledge, uh, sustained attacks on spokespersons for public health science, that would be Anthony Fauci. And we are beginning to see in our social science research that among those who are reliant on media channels that have advance those attacks, the credibility of Anthony Fauci has been dropping. Sustained overall in the public overall, we still have high trust and confidence that we're getting good information from FDA, CDC, Anthony Fauci, but you're starting to see erosion in some, in some places. Are, are you, as you are writing and thinking about helping people to write about the science, concerned at all that some of the sources that we have taken for granted as certifiable certifiers of knowledge are no longer trusted as certifiers of knowledge among some of those who read you um, or who pay attention to the knowledge you're disseminating. And I, I would just say absolutely. I mean, I think I mentioned this earlier, but you know, I wrote a, a story about how many people have died of COVID, and you know, I couldn't even convince people in my own family with it. You know, and this this is someone, you know, that they are inclined to, you know, otherwise believe. You know, up until then, they had always praised what a great journalist I was and how proud they are of my work. Until all of a sudden, it's you know, clashing with their belief systems. And I think it's just really difficult. And I, I think about this a lot because, you know, the fact is when people are deciding what to believe, I, I think those of us who've worked in this, in this area know that facts aren't the thing that convince people. You know, people think in stories, they think in narratives, but there's also this whole question of what constitutes credible evidence. And so, you know, for me, a scientific study is much more credible than something I read on the internet from, um, you know, a homeopathic doctor say, but for some other people, that other, that other person and the story that they're peddling is much more credible or the story that they're hearing. You know, I think one of the most powerful sources of information that people are paying attention to are personal anecdotes from people that they know. And so you hear a lot of stories of a friend of a friend or my friend's uncle and things like this. Um, you know, I, I encountered someone the other day who had decided not to get a vaccine because his friend's uncle had gone deaf after getting the vaccine, you know, supposedly. You know, how do I counteract that with facts? I really can't. It's really difficult. And we're in a situation now where we have entire media enterprises that are built on, you know, not the kind of journalism that the, the three of us here have uh, come up doing and that has been traditional journalism, which is based on facts. And, you know, my job as a journalist is to go gather the information and, and try to put it together in a coherent story and to separate, you know, what's true from what's not. It's not to give both sides, you know, sometimes there aren't both sides and it's really important that we don't present the, the idea that there are two sides when sometimes one side is just factually incorrect. But once, uh, you know, that erroneous information has been judged credible or it's coming from a source that a particular group considers uh, credible, it's incredibly hard to overturn that. And I think in those instances, 
really the, the way, the only way forward that I have seen workable, it has to come from within that community. It has to come from someone that has been deemed a credible authority. And lots of times that's not me. <laughs> Christy, I thought I heard you say something else in your presentation, which was that you drew on three different strains of evidence in order to make your case. Um, Richard, are you seeing people look to alternative ways to certify, including drawing in forms of convergent evidence from multiple sources as a means of establishing the credibility of things that might now be might be challenged now by people who doubt the traditional authorities? And are there other ways in which you are responding to that challenge? Yeah, well, uh, this is a this is a tough issue, of course, because I mean we talk about the public, but there is no public. I mean, people there's it is so fractionated these days that uh, I mean, if if you ask me what what the NPR audience is doing, that's very different. I think I think they are overwhelmingly in support of of the ideas and and the authority that that Tony Fauci carries. Uh, but uh, but but I, but they but. People, you know, people get, you know, people who don't like him are not listening to NPR. They're they're getting completely other sources of information. So this is a further conundrum for me. It's like what what I tell my audience doesn't necessarily have anything to do with uh, with this this group of individuals. Now, of course, there are NPR listeners who are who don't believe in vaccination, uh, childhood vaccines. I mean, because it's not nothing is is monolithic. But I think. Uh, part of the part of the real issue here is is just the so people get so, so many there are so many different channels of information and and I don't you know people don't necessarily uh, go to from you know from Fox News to NPR that much they're, you're they're going to choose one or the other so I think that as, for if people start to select multiple sources of information it's more likely to be the New York Times plus NPR or Fox News plus uh, plus some other you know Facebook friends group that is full of conspiracy theories. So it's, so it's a, uh, uh, I think it's, it's a deeper problem than just thinking about how I as a journalist can, uh, can put out uh, what I consider to be the best information. And Manya, uh, Christy talked about turning to sources that people can trust. I see part of what you do as helping us build trust in the people who write for you. And you gave us some preliminary advice about the ways in which you were doing that by certifying personal experience and personal credibility. Are there other ways in which you see that you can you can help our the scholars who are writing with you uh, build the credibility that will overcome the reservations people might have about other forms of authority and lead to trust in them as a voice? I, I mean, I, it's. Um always surprising actually before I answer that question I just wanted to, to uh, remember to say that you know I now have a new job in when I when I'm working with my articles and that is reading for any individual sentence that might be taken out of, out of context um, we I used to have to do that you know routinely for if I was covering something about embryonic stem cells or you know something that touched on evolution and now I I just try to do it routinely. So I like I, I and, and just insert little ugly bits um, it, so that so that so that um, I don't have anyone tweeting nature says and then something that um, is, 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 is not in context. It, and it, it, it often makes for um, an article that does not read as well in its entirety, but is, is de-risked. So it's a it's it's kind of of um, painful. Um, I, I think one thing that I um, find myself doing a lot is is just trying to get my authors to really drill down to why it matters and try to. Um, I, I think um, you know academics are used to writing for an, an almost captive audience. They they put out a, they put out a paper and they know that everybody in their field needs to read it to stay current in the field. And that's and so so if they put it out, someone will read it. But that's not the case for the opinion articles in in nature because because we're we're too diverse. And so I'm I'm always um, trying to talk to them about how do you make it so that somebody wants to read this article, how do you make it so that it's it's relevant? Um, I'm I'm really pushing them to talk about why they study the questions rather than the intricacies of what is the technical definition of gain of, gain of function, <laughs> um, that kind of thing. And Richard, the as as we think about your statement about preprints, um, obviously an, an emergent science in the middle of a crisis with high levels of public anxiety and knowledge not really there to answer some of the key questions. There's a whole new set of constraints on journalists as they try to decide when do we move this into the public discussion and when don't we? 
do you have tests of strength of the evidence that you could articulate uh, that would help guide listeners, readers, and others to a sense of what constitutes strength of evidence for us? Because you said you were going to wait for the quality study, but didn't tell us how you would know it was a quality study. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think one thing I do, uh, uh, or I, I did do, I, I, as, I, as you mentioned at the, in, in the introduction, I'm no longer uh, working, practicing as a, as a daily journalist. But one thing I, uh, one, re one reason I would actually report on preprints even before COVID was if I saw several reports that were all pointing in the same direction uh, and from different labs coming to similar conclusions, then, then I would figure, okay, this is not just some idea that is that is likely to, you know, evaporate when somebody else takes a look at it. Uh, so that's that's one thing I really look at is uh, trying to decide, um, uh, you know, is is there supporting evidence? Does it make sense either in in in, in the published literature that I hadn't noticed or new preprints or whatever, pr preferably in the published literature? But uh, but that's that's certainly one test that I have often applied. I mean, sometimes if it's just a huge old finding that is that just seems like really important even if it's questionable i think uh uh i think journalists felt do feel like we need to report this this is a big thing it's on to all over twitter whatever it's getting a lot of attention and we we have to do our best job to report it to bring in the uncertainties and so on and and try to try to convince our audiences that this is not the last word on the on the topic but people read selectively people read what they people retain what they want to so you can have all the caveats in the world uh in your article and and people will if people are totally convinced of one side or the other they will they'll skip the caveats uh so so that's that's an issue in terms of the the ivermectin ivermectin study somebody has um posted a a, a, a a publication on in our in our comment section that I actually have not read yet to see whether that is sort of the definitive article that I had been waiting for. I can judge by coverage of other journalists who follow the same kind of practices that I follow, and and no one is no one I've seen has reported that as like as as really strong evidence that it actually works. There have been plenty of studies uh, of other. Uh, medications that seem to be really good on, on in the first blush or whatever. Uh, there was even some positive results around the uh, anti-malarial drugs uh, for COVID-19 uh, that got people really excited about that. But, uh, it, uh, but uh, you know, uh, single studies generally don't 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 last. I, I think the other really important issue here is that uh, once people sort of start to become true believers in it or really believe what the testing is going to work, uh, they're going to they're going to interpret their results in such ways to have positive results. And if they get negative results, they're not going to publish. So uh, this is familiar to the world of meta science for sure. That if you do a meta analysis, you're missing all the studies that found that it didn't work because nobody bothered to write a pre or few people bothered to write preprints and saying this didn't work. The bar was maybe lower for COVID-19 because there was a fair amount also in the literature, in the preprint literature around uh, negative studies. But I think that's another, that's another real pitfall that journalists have to be aware of, uh, as scientists are, about, uh, about how to interpret a, a study, even a meta-analysis. I think the other thing that we were really seeing here is sort of the creation of factions within the scientific community. And this, this I think, made it a little more challenging to report as well, where people were really kind of, you know, particularly in the early days when we didn't, there was a lot, I mean, there's still a lot we don't know. But, you know, a year ago, there was a lot more that we didn't know. But there were sort of groups forming around particular ideas. And this sort of, you know, scientists are humans, too. And I think preprints can be really interesting in a lot of ways. They're not a substitute for peer review, but I think we all know that peer review is very imperfect too. Um, one thing that I will sometimes do uh, when I'm assessing a study and I'm not sure about it is I will actually uh, run it by someone um, who's a statistician or someone who um, does study design sorts of things and ask them specifically about, you know, is this statistical analysis appropriate in this case? You know, is this the methods here? Because I'm not an expert in all of this stuff. And although I've learned a lot over the years, there's way more I don't know. And I don't trust myself to be the final arbiter here, but I can go to someone and I will specifically look for someone who doesn't have a dog in the fight and say, you know, is this an appropriate way of studying this question? And in particular, is the, the answer that this study is presenting, is it really applicable in the way that it's being applied? You know, is this something that can be generalized? Yeah, because the problem here is that I want to know whether I should 
wear masks to the grocery store, right? And maybe there's a study that looked at masks in a lab. That's not the same, the same um, experience. It doesn't mean that they don't apply, but the study can only answer, you know, questions about that specific set of circumstances. And then we can, we can generalize it out. And in many cases, that's pretty appropriate and we can feel fairly confident. But in other cases, you know, there, there have been studies during COVID that just have been wildly misapplied and, and, you know, misused to make arguments. And I think this is where it's been confusing. And, and the other thing that I think has been really interesting is that, um, you know, it's been hard to assess. I think we all have uh, scientists that we look to as being credible. Um, but then in this case, a lot of them were disagreeing and in some cases disagreeing, you know, very vehemently. And so, you know, you can't, you know, I, I tried pretty hard not to use that as the only um, badge of credibility, whether I think someone's done good work in the past. I think it's really important. One of the things that I, I personally try to do is always challenge whatever conclusion I'm sort of instinctually wanting to come to on something, because I think, you know, the hardest thing, but also the most important thing is to maintain that open mind to make sure that you really are always being open to new evidence and really looking at it with clear eyes and, and sort of an open mind. It's very easy to be dismissive of things if it's uh, you know, challenging your preordained conclusion. And I think it's just human nature that the more you look at a, at a question, the more certain you become, and that's okay. That's what evidence does, um, but we still have to be open to that overturning and, and, and changing our priors. And, and that can be difficult to do. And I think it's especially challenging with COVID where you saw a lot of good scientists really coming down with very, you know, on very different sides of various debates. And the other issue I think that we should keep in mind is that we have science and we have data that's you know showing certain things. But at the end of the day, a lot of the decisions that need to be made, policies are not just about science. They're also about other factors. And so often this comes down to value judgments and those aren't things that science can answer. And I think it's helpful to sort of be very clear on what part of this is a scientific question and what part of this is a values judgment and a you know, determination that's being based on, you know, what's important to you and whether you value, you know, having kids in school versus, um, you know, saving um, immunocompromised people from getting a disease. I, I wonder if, if the journalistic community should be telling us more about how it determines whether a study is worthy of being shared when it shares the study so that the public would come to understand that when we have a kind of competing selective uses of the science that Christy, you're talking about, where I have my hydroxy study and you have your hydroxychloroquine study mm -hmm. and they're reaching opposite conclusions. If perhaps the journalistic community and the science community talking to the journalistic community should begin to say such things as, there's the difference between an in vitro study and an observational study and a randomized controlled clinical trial that has placebo controls and is double blinded. And this is falling here on the spectrum, and this is falling here on the spectrum, but they could all be well or poorly done. There's a different kind of knowing, a different way of doing a different strength of knowing as a way of explaining that this is not just, I picked the study I agree with ideologically, trust me, I'm certifying the science. You know, I, I think the journalistic community is is definitely adapting and changing and, and improving, but I'm not sure that they're super explicit about about the process, like I think it's it's I see much more common. I see um, and and uh, I ask myself um, for to, um, paragraphs about what future studies need to be done, what other studies need to be done, what studies pe people are waiting for, and that's a really nice way to um, both show that science is a process and and to prepare people for uncertainty to give give readers a sense a sense of uncertainty. And I think something, I, I'm really curious what what um, uh, Christy and Richard have observed, but I think the way that um, that journalists cover individual articles has really changed. I mean, they're, they're, um, I think that individual papers are coming off of, off of the pedestal and being seen as more of a body of research. I mean, if you look at some of the like, how to do, how to be a science writer books from 10 years ago, there was the, like the one study paper. Like this was the first paper, this was the first kind of news article you would learn how to write. And, and they would say, interview the author, interview an, out, an outside source, in, maybe interview a second outside source, big bam, boom. This is, this is the article that you assign to the intern on their first day. It was a, it was a canonical type 
of science news story. And I don't see that as much. I don't see I don't see editors handing off a single a single study as you know as, as the definitive word to a relatively inexperienced journalist. They want they want journalists who know the topic a bit, who know oh if I want to understand the importance of this paper, I need to I need to make sure I bring in that paper and that paper and these are the three people that I need to talk to. Um, so I do think that there's an I, I run I would love to know what Christy and Richard think, but I do think there's an increased sophistication. I don't think that increased sophistication has been uh, communicated to the general public. Yeah, I think that's it's it's spotty. I think that yes, for for good old science papers about uh, black holes or whatever. I think Manya, you're right. I think we see a lot more of that. But every day, I see single study uh, reports in the New York Times, uh, and they will they'll throw in a line that is like, "Oh, this study hasn't been peer reviewed," and they feel figure that that sort of absolves them of any other further explanation about. Whether, you know, it's like, well, I said it wasn't peer reviewed, so it might not, you know, so uh, it hasn't been published or whatever. And I think I think that's lame. And I see way too much of it, uh, even even in my beloved New York Times uh, uh, and journalists I know and 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 uh, and respect. But I think that they're I think they're wrong on this one. And uh, but I, I also think that you can get too far into the weeds and say, well, this is a you know, this is there are various uh, 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 and explain to people the level of evidence. And I think you'll lose audience if you if I spent too much time saying, well, this is a case control study that has less evidence than a, you know, than a randomized controlled trial or, or you know, and, and trying to explain, I mean, sometimes that is necessary and helpful, but I think that you don't, but it's also easy to just uh, give people so much information that they don't quite know how to handle that, uh, uh, that if they don't have really the background to understand all that, I don't, I'm not sure it's serving the public uh, to, to spend a lot of time on talking about the methodology, but I think it's very important for us as journalists to be exercising that judgment and saying, oh, well, this is just, you know, this is in vitro study. This is, you know, uh, we shouldn't get too excited about this, or this is in mice, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, there's certainly been a long history of, of, you know, cancer cures in mice that had gotten a lot of ink uh, undeservedly, but I, I think we're, I think we're a step away from that, but still, I think, uh, I think knowing where, where your audience, how much your audience wants to know. I think Christy probably uh, thinks about this differently depending upon which of her publications she writes for because her publications have very different audiences and uh, and I think they have different appetites for that kind of stuff, right? That's absolutely correct. And But I also want to go back to what Manu was, Manu was saying. I think that it's absolutely true that uh, a lot of journalists have gotten a lot better at this. I think sort of the the culture of what's okay and what's good science journalism has changed during my career. Um, you know, early in my career, I was writing a lot of those stories that she was talking about where it's one study, you get an outside voice, maybe two, boom, bam, bam, you know, you're done. I think there's a lot less of that. It's not to say that it's not done, but I think among people who self-identify as science journalists who are writing for maybe a more sophisticated audience than just a daily news uh, you know, general publication sort of audience, I think that that the bar has been raised. At the same time, I think, um, and this may be something that a lot of scientists aren't as aware of, but I think the economics of what's gone on in the news business over the last 20 years has played a big role here. I mean, there's just, it, it takes a lot more time, it takes a lot more bandwidth, it takes more resources to do those better stories. And a lot of newsrooms just don't don't have those resources. Uh, reporters are overstressed. They have to do more with less. Um, you know, I've been a freelancer for most of my career, and I can tell you, as a freelancer, I make a lot less money when I do that really careful, slow journalism than when I can churn things out like that. And that creates an environment where it's in a lot of cases the journalist's interest to you know do a, a quicker job and maybe to you know I'm not going to make those five extra calls, particularly if maybe some of them don't end up in the story because I have a deadline and I'm I'm not getting paid by the hour. I'm getting paid by the piece, and I'll just mention here, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, the first story I ever uh, published in the New York Times was 2006, 2007. I was paid a dollar a word. I have a story coming out in the New York Times tomorrow or Monday. I'm getting paid a dollar a word. You know, that's, that's a long stretch of no pay raises. It's just, you know, meanwhile, uh, everything else has gotten more expensive. So I think the economics here are one reason why that you know, one thing that makes it difficult for good journalism to happen, um, even among staffers, it's just a lot of places have lost their copy editors. People are having to do more with less. 
I wonder if there's a way for journalists to conventionalize some language to avoid the problem that Richard's concerned about, which is too much methodological detail, we're gonna lose audiences and it's gonna become an incomprehensible story, which is to say, study in mice may not apply to humans, just bottom line. Observational study, there may be other factors accounting for outcome. So begin to try to teach people the kind of thing that we've taught because people can recite back to us, correlation is not causation. We've basically given them a bottom line to say, here's a caution about this so that when we are covering things that seem to be worthy of coverage, but may not yet provide answers that are conclusive enough to justify, for example, humans taking a drug and an FDA approval, we're starting to signal that science has some rules that govern how these things are able to draw inference, how these processes are able to draw inferences. And when I pick one rather than another, that little rule ought to say, well, this one may be stronger than that one, all things being equal if they're of comparable quality. Let me ask the one last question before we turn to question to the uh, Q and A's in the, in the chat. So what do we do when we get the big retraction? So there was major hydroxychloroquine study, big retraction, major ivermectin study, big retraction. How do we cover when science decertifies knowledge that has been offered to the public with a lot of, of ex, uh, exposition, big headlines in major outlets, lots of people believe science thought they knew something, scientists thought they knew something, and now scientists saying, whoa, something was wrong here. And Richard, you wrote a book that dealt with this. I'm going to start with you. Yeah, it's a, it's a big issue because people, uh, and, uh, and, uh, just the way I think scientists are reluctant to admit their mistakes and retract unless they're really their feet are held to the fire. I think uh, maybe the attitude of journalists is also pretty much well. People have forgotten about that. That was months ago, and so I don't need to make as big a deal of it. Or you know, or if you know, we we always see that by and large corrections are you know uh, buried inside the papers, regardless of where the article itself went, with 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 some notable exceptions. But yeah, I think I think. Uh, I think that this, in the case of hydroxychloroquine, clearly uh, plenty of plenty of coverage about around that has been oh this stuff doesn't work. So even if even if people didn't focus on the retraction per se, I think the 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 net result is people who pay attention to mainstream news publications and organizations know that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. So you don't necessarily need to have you know a four and a half minute piece on all things considered that says, remember that four and a half minute piece we had six months ago? Well, now we're going to, we're going to say that's not true, but you definitely want to have that. You want to have, make sure that the, that the, that the message sort of accumulates that every time you talk about hydroxychloroquine, you say it, it an unproven treatment or one that didn't work or whatever. I think it's more important to get a, to convey the uh, the information about the uh, you know that the public really cares about, which is should I take this or not, as opposed to talking about that the you know the the more mechanical part of this that this was a paper that it had, and, a, and a retraction followed that and, and the scientific enterprise had had corrected itself you know had had stepped in to correct this. Uh, uh, but I think you you raise a good point, Kathleen, which is that we maybe don't spend enough time talking about to the extent to which. The, the scientific community is successful uh, in, in self-correcting because uh, retractions are a useful tool, but they're obviously uh, very underused. Uh, and, uh, and so, but we should, we should maybe talk more about how the scientific enterprise goes about truth finding, not just individual scientists, but the public in publication and, and these other methods that, that sort of help, uh, the, help us sort of tilt towards the truth in the long run. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, um, you know, part of this is really about um, showing more of the scientific process and how it works. I think if the, the lay public had a better understanding of how science works, like the actual process of science, I think this would be a lot easier for people to understand. But I think that it's important for us to cover retractions and to show that this is science actually working as it should. And that, you know, when we find mistakes and we correct them, this is, you know, journalists do this all the time. This is the standard in our profession. If I make an error in a story, it doesn't matter how small or insignificant it might seem, we run a correction and we, we make sure that it's correct and that's on the record of that story. And I think you know science and scientific papers should be the same way. But as journalists, I think we can really do a service to our readers by walking them through this and explaining to them what happened. And also, I think it's important for the public to understand that frankly, you know, science is done by people and human beings are fallible. 
Um, there are people who cheat and lie in science, just like there are people who cheat and lie in any other profession. And so, you know, I, I think it's important. One of the things that distinguishes science journalism from science communication is that, you know, we are taking a critical eye to science. It doesn't mean that we're coming to tear it down. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't think science is great, but it's our job to look for the, the flaws and to look for those problems and to identify them and to cover them, just like we would do if we were covering politics or some other subject. And so uh, it's not our job to be science boosters. And I think this is something that a lot of scientists don't often understand. Yeah, I, I, Mani, would you like to add something? Um, yeah, I was, I was mainly um, agreeing with what's good been said before, but I, I do want to give a call out for Retraction Watch, which I, I think is an incredible service because, um, you know, I, I, um, when we're working on articles, as soon as it publishes, it no longer exists in our brains. It's not something that yeah. we're actively thinking about. We're thinking about the next story. So sometimes, um, we don't automatically find out that something that we've written about or covered has has been retracted. There's not those automatic processes where you're scanning tables of contents to look for things things that are interested. And so Retraction Watch is a nice way to um, alert people that, oh, this has been retracted because the authors are probably not going to get in touch with you. Um, sometimes it happens and say, hey, that thing you wrote about not working. Um, so, so the these kinds of alert systems are 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 really important. Um, it can be difficult to get your editor to commission a story on a retraction um, because you know there there is a bit of competition for space and 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 resources. Um, I think people are more willing to to um, add a correction to a story or run something. I've also seen. Uh, I, I've also seen both scientists and journalists say, hey, this this article that um, I wrote about or that I put out, it has been retracted. And you just see it on Twitter, um, which I think is um, uh, an uh, another way of, of getting the word out. And I think those those should be used more. Yeah, I think Twitter has become a, a really um, useful reporting tool. I try to be very mindful, though, that it's only a very small subset of scientists who are on it. So I think it's important not to you know, misrepresent it as sort of the scientific consensus as a whole. But I find it extremely useful for sort of listening in on some of the chatter that's going on on things, but also just seeing, you know, things like this. Very often it's the first place I will hear about a particular study or of a retraction or of a discussion that's going on about uh, shortcomings in a particular study. I'm gonna now turn to the chat queue to, to try to retain credibility having promised that I would do so. Um, and I'm just going to pick the, the uh, questions that are most interesting to me. Uh, is that single study approach to journalism an historical relic from a time when single papers were indeed incredibly impactful and opened new paths? Thinking of Einstein's papers on relativity, for example, and it would be consistent with the still persistent myth of the lone genius scientist. Jump ball, anybody take it. I don't think it's, a, I think it's um, a relic of science journalism, sort of, I think in the earlier days, it was a little bit more science. I don't know, R Richard's been doing this longer <laughs> than me. I'm not calling you old Richard, I promise. But uh, you know, I think a lot of stuff, particularly with things like space, there was a lot of kind of science boosterism. And I think there was just more trust that like, oh, this is all great. And like, we can just trust scientists. And I'm not saying I mistrust them, but I think there was less, maybe less, reporting that was sort of not taking the assumption that everyone everything is just uh, perfect to begin with. I would also chalk this up to marketing uh, on the part of the, the, the scientific journals like Nature and Science, which yeah. weekly put out a, a press digest and say, here are all the really exciting studies that we have report on something. And uh, and it, it's low hanging fruit for a science journalist who says, what am I going to do this week? And it's also with the embargo system, uh, basically, you know that you're not going to get scoop because no one can go with it until the embargo is lifted. So I think that whole system, which benefited the journals and benefited the journalists, also increased encourage this, uh, that kind of approach to, to science journalism. And I think that that, that is wanes somewhat, but I think it's still, it's still active. You can you certainly still uh, read stories on, uh, of that nature on, on, on a regular basis. But I think, I think that was a, a very powerful driving force as well. I agree. Yeah, I think it's more journalism and, and, and promotion that's changed than the scientific paper. I'm not saying the scientific paper hasn't changed, but in terms of, of coverage, I think it's I don't think it's because of the nature of the paper. 
Uh, do any of the three of you have in mind a, a, a single study that's the equivalent of Einstein? Uh, we'd like to say that, wait a minute, there are in fact those momentous studies that are so important that I'd love to know the coverage of Einstein. I know that one, that was rejected, right? If I recall, it had some trouble getting published because there wasn't a lot of um, experimental evidence. I, I'm, I'm, I'm bad, Where, where's Eileen Fife? I, I, um, I don't know my science history well enough. Yeah, I think occasionally uh, 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 the New England Journal or JAMA will publish a, a study that's been a huge, uh, many years in the making, a, a very large analysis of, of some important uh, treatment that really will change the course of, of treatment. And I think that's not Einsteinian impact, but I think there are some examples you can look to where a single study, if it involved you know, huge numbers of people uh, and, uh, and, and has clinical relevance that may change practice immediately, those kinds of studies I think really still, still do deserve to get uh, individual attention. Yeah, and some tools like CRISPR, RNAi. Um. Yeah, yeah. Can we pick up another question? There's some evidence that scientists themselves are, are one of the sources of misinformation in science journalism. Do you think the role of journalists is to report what scientists are saying, or do you think journalists have a responsibility to somehow do independent vetting of what scientists say before conveying their messages to the public? I absolutely believe it's my job to, to do some vetting. I mean, I, I assume I'm not alone in this. I've very often had scientists misrepresent their findings. And I mean, I think we've all seen this. If you read the abstract of a paper and the conclusions that are heralded there often aren't held up. You know, they're the just so stories that are being told about the data. And I think, you know, this goes back to my earlier point of not being a science booster, but a science journalist. And that is, you know, it's our job to sort of interrogate the evidence and look at what's there. Yeah, I have an example of this from from the, from COVID, which is uh, there's a paper that got a preprint that got a, a fair amount of attention because it was a group in Italy that was trying to figure out the incidence of long COVID among children, and they did a yeah. questionnaire of parents, about 130 parents, and uh, and they came to the conclusion or the way their uh, their findings were interpreted was basically that 40% of all kids who get COVID end up with long COVID. And, uh, and it was uh, started to be picked up by particularly alternative practice practitioners and so on. I actually went and I looked at the original paper and it was just, they themselves were pretty bad or preprint. They themselves were actually pretty badly misrepresenting their own findings. Uh, they essentially didn't mention what I thought was the most important finding. They, you know, they asked, it was a questionnaire thing and asking parents about the health of their kids and so on. And a fair number of kids had runny noses after COVID and didn't have parents didn't remember them from before. And that was a significant part of the 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 conclusions that these children were were symptomatic from COVID low these many months later. But they asked the parents also. Overall, on a scale from zero to 100, how do you rate your children's health? And the, uh, and the parents uh, uh, said pre-COVID, it was like, uh, I have the numbers here. Uh, they said it was 96.3 uh, 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 was the average of this, of this health index, which is pretty high. And then after COVID, it was 92.9. Uh, so it was a very small decrement, no, no, no statistics to know whether there's even a significant difference at all. And they basically buried that finding uh, in their paper. Uh, which ultimately was published, by the way, in a in a uh, in a obscure pediatrics journal. But at any rate, you know, I I actually read that paper when people started talking about it, and I and I saw these conclusions, and I r realized, you know, these scientists are not being really very direct with what, with their their own findings, and they're they're making a lot out of out of pretty thin rule. And so, yeah, absolutely, that's 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 an imperative part of uh, of good science journalism. Next question. We scientists are very concerned and very aware about hierarchies of expertise. There are MDs at the bottom, then PhDs in a subject, and then, oh, I think there are MDs objecting to this one. There are <laughs> MDs at the bottom, and then PhDs in a subject, then people who spend an entire career studying something, and then some of them that are at the very top of their field. But the public seems to believe that everyone with a PhD is exactly the same, and MDs are more knowledgeable than that. How do we convince the public that quote unquote expert is a multi-level concept? And do you think that this is even a problem? I mean, I actually think it's worse than that. I think that, you know, we're in a situation right now where just expertise in general has been very much downplayed. And there's been a lot of doubt about this, whether you can trust academics in general. 
So I, I think for people that are dismissive of that, it doesn't matter to them whether it's an MD or a PhD or, or what that is. Um, I think that those, those sorts of titles are, are not really things that the general public thinks about. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, I think it's, it's important for us to really show how do we know, why is this person the appropriate person to be speaking on this? And I think it's absolutely a problem. Um, I think the thing that I see the most is uh, people with an MD going around and talking about things they have no training in, although we also see that um, people with PhDs um, in an entirely different field going on about a field they know nothing about. Yeah. Let me just add one small point to this, which is that uh, the Associated Press decided decades ago that if you're an, an MD, you will get the title doctor in a, in a story. And if you have a PhD, you won't. And the rationale being that uh, that uh, that people assume take the word doctor to assume that it's a uh, somebody who's capable of, of issuing medical advice. Uh, and so doctors and dentists get uh, are called doctor so-and-so and people with PhDs are not. And any news organization that follows that, uh, that AP style, which is many, including NPR, will not call a PhD doctor and they will call an MD doctor. Uh, many other news organizations, I think, are, uh, are inconsistent about how, how they deal with that. Uh, but uh, uh, and, and there are always there are always a few ex exceptions like uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, Dr. Jill uh, Biden, uh, but uh, but uh, at any rate that 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 further muddies the the waters uh, that the questioner has raised. How do you certify the expertise of someone? So when when you're quoting someone um, or you're building up that person's credential because you're you're putting forward a commentary by that person. What, what do you see as those things that certify that this person is worthy of acceptance? That is, that this, this person has, is able to offer you knowledge that has some presumption of, 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 of acceptance, worthiness. What do, you, what do you tell them? Tell who? The, the individual or the, the tell reader? The reader. So, so you know, if, if, when, when, you're, when you're telling someone that this is an expert at a topic by virtue of quoting them, are there certain basic lines of argument that you use to certify their credibility? In my, in my own mind, yes. I figure that, honestly, I figure if people trust me, people trust me uh, to, to choose people who know what they're talking about, and they're going to trust that I'm not going to pull somebody out of left field. So, so I don't spend a lot of time building up people's bona fides in an article. I expect that if people are listening to what I have to say, because they're likely to trust me, so I don't I don't bother with that. But I do take care to make sure that I'm interviewing people who are who have credibility. I look at their I look at uh, any variety of things, but uh, often it's how I get to them. If it's through referrals from people I know and trust in the field, they say, "Oh, here's a good person to talk to." I think that's a very important uh, thing. Obviously, if they're authors of major papers around a topic or review papers, I look at that as well, or just various other sorts of uh, science of credibility, those, those sorts of things. There's no, there's no one way to do it, but I, but, uh, um, but, um, I, I'm, but yeah, that's kind of the. I usually look to see that the person has, has published in that field or has some sort of uh, visible expertise in the field. And sometimes it may be someone who, um, you know, I, I would rather quote someone from a smaller university that doesn't have a big name, but they have a lot of publications and seem to have expertise on that than someone that's at a big name school who's kind of speaking out of their lane a little bit. And I think that's something we've seen a lot in COVID is a lot of people mm -hmm. speaking outside of their expertise and getting, getting a platform because of, you know, the name that they're, they have, um, I won't name any universities, but <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I remember we had a conversation about this years ago. Um, anyway, but I, I do think that um, this, this to me, it feels less like the issue than the, the public just feeling that experts in general are not credible. I mean, the people that are resistant to a lot of the stories that we're putting out are resistant to expertise writ large and not just the difference between MD and PhD is maybe beyond them, although they will take the MD or the, you know, there are a lot of other alternative practitioners who will call themselves doctors too. And, uh, you know, who do not have P who do not have MDs. But one reason for asking the question is because you saw throughout, throughout COVID people appearing largely on cable in which the MD was the certification. And then some institution was attached to that MD. So if this is an MD and they are tied to X hospital, X university, et cetera, as if it was a two-pronged certification. 
they have the, the degree and they're tied to someplace reputable. And occasionally we find that the place they were supposedly tied to, the tie was so loose that you wouldn't have considered it a tie for journalistic standards. But it seemed that there was the implication to the public that if you had the degree and you were tied to something whose name you recognized, uh, that that should be sufficient to be able to qualify you to speak about COVID. And not that there needed to be something else, which is you had studied it or you had some kind of primary expertise in it that you were bringing to bear. And I thought I heard Christy say that one of the things that you're, you do to try to certify someone is to make sure that they're not involved in the study as you're vetting the study to determine how and whether you're going to cover it. I've noticed that in some cases, journalists tell us that. So they quote someone and they say, who had no role in the study. Well, that's a way of telling the public that you have an independent critique, you have an outsider perspective. So I'm interested in the ways in which, in a time in which expertise is being challenged, in which institutionalized authorities are being challenged, we're using the resources of journalists to help put in place some legitimate basis for, in, for inference about the ability of people to speak knowledgeably about knowledge. Let me jump to another question. How can you convey the intrinsic irreducible uncertainty of science to the public without eroding trust in the scientific process? That's the million dollar question, right? I mean, that, that's the thing. I, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about this and wondering, you know, how do we help the public understand this without losing their trust in science? And I think one conclusion that I've come to is it's actually, I think that credibility of science can actually be increased if we can help people understand the process a little bit more, because I think this binary view that the public has of science as being this thing that, you know, identifies truth you know, black and white, that that is actually what corrodes uh, trust in science, because then each time those provisional uh, answers are overturned, people say, oh, science isn't credible, instead of saying, oh, here's science working as it should. So I guess that's sort of the approach I've come to. At the same time, this approach requires a lot of nuance that very often we just don't have the room for, or edi editors don't have the, the appetite for. And frankly, I mean, here's another issue that I think hasn't been raised here. And that is how many people actually read our articles? I hate to say this, but this is something that happens all the time. And it's not just about people tweeting things that they've clearly never read because they're making a point that was made in the story if they had read the damn story. Um, but it's just that you know, even putting these things and having this nuanced uh, language in the story, it may not get through. And people really, they remember the headlines and they remember the big takeaways. They remember, you know, they may not ever get past the lead of the story. And so that makes it very challenging if that's the environment in which we're working. You know, writing a 5,000 word story is going to get very few readers compared to a 500 word story. You know, the number of people who will have the attention span to read it is gonna be much less. And so that longer story will get into a lot more nuance, but you'll also get it, you know, to fewer eyes. And so how do you negotiate this? I don't know, I, I, I would love to know the answer because nothing is apparent to me. But I think, um... I think this idea of scientists making mistakes and that undermining credibility, I, I think that that is to some degree overblown. I, somebody else will know more details um, than I do, but I know that um, uh, Brian Nosick's group has looked at this a little bit. I seem to recall that a couple of years ago, um, um, Pew in their survey, PEW -E um, in, their, in their surveys about trust in science added a question of does it do you trust less, do, do you trust scientists less if they admit to making mistakes and, and it, they said that trust went up. So I, I think that, um, I don't think that it's a big concern that admitting mistakes will undermine scientists' credibility. I do share uh, Christie's concern about less respect for expertise, but I don't think that admitting mistakes is eroding trust and expertise. And I, I also think that, uh, that it, it's, it's not a simple bi binary. There are many people uh, who will, you know, you say, would you get on an airplane? Are you worried that the laws of physics will, will stop while you're in the air? And, no, and almost nobody will be concerned about that. Or if you trust in antibiotics, the numbers are very high. At the same time, those, those same people who trust antibiotics and a lot of other th stuff about modern medicine may also be uh, 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 people who don't accept the, uh, 
theory of evolution. And it's like they can hold these ideas separately in, in their minds. And it's not, it's not either or. It's not people who believe in science and people who don't. I think people pretty much pick and choose. And unfortunately, uh, in this, in this hyper-politicized environment now, uh, there's, there's, there's more opportunities for people to pick and choose. And I think that it's, in some ways, it's a, it's a, the, the problem really rests less necessarily in people's perception of science than it does in kind of these, these, these politically driven influences that, uh, that are driving people to conclusions uh, as well. And I think that's, that's, that's in, in, in my mind, a bigger problem. Let me stay on the topic of uncertainty. What is your sense that readers are resistant to uncertainty? Are there strategies that you use to get readers excited about uncertainty? For example, I wonder whether the public would have fun reading about scientific studies in a registered report format, learning about the study first, and then the results are the big reveal. I would love to think that because I'm a nerd about this kind of stuff. <laughs> Um, I have personally had trouble convincing editors of this. So, and editors are like only a, a small proxy to the reading public. I mean, I think uncertainty is really exciting. That's where scientific discoveries are made. It's the stuff, you know, you look at the circumstances under which whatever finding doesn't hold, that's how you sort of find the boundaries. This is really uh, the frontier of scientific discovery. Um, but that's a hard lesson to learn, I think. But I do, I do think there's potential there, though, to bring that excitement to readers. Um, so maybe this is an opportunity we're missing a little bit. And, and I, I think, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Mon, Mon, you go ahead. Um, I think uh, building on what Kathleen had said about formalized language, or what um, you know, like this is a study in mice, or this is a study um, that that has this specific limitation. I, I think that um, it just as a a routine caveat there's there needs to be these are the studies that other scientists want to see you see it a lot these are the scientists that these people that the, the authors themselves hope to hope to do i think um when you talk about when you can wrap up uncertainty into next steps um i i think that's um a good way to make things make things clear these are the alternatives these are the uh, explanations that still need to be ruled out those kinds mm -hmm. of things Next question. Every few months, there's a debate about whether journalists should run their articles by scientists before publishing. On one hand, people will argue, whoops, I just lost the place in the, in the, the form, so I'm, I'm going to lose, lose that here. On one hand, people will argue that journalists should be independent and free to write articles how they wish. But on the other hand, people will argue that there can be high costs to publishing an article that misunderstands the science. Both of these seem to be valid points. How do you navigate this tension in your own work? Well, well, I, well, certainly, oh, go, go ahead, Chrissy, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to dominate. Um, I solve this with fact checking. I mean, I, you know, the scientist doesn't get to write the story because again, I'm a journalist, I'm not dictating, you know, science communicator is a different thing. You know, the person working at their university or their institution to publicize the finding has, they're tasked with telling that scientist version of, of that study, their, their research, whatever, but as a journalist, you know, that's, that's not my mandate, which is different. And I think, um, you know, most of the places that I work for will, will just absolutely do not allow me to run um, a story by sources beforehand. That's just not allowed. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons is what happens is I get a nice quote and people want to change it because they sound like a human being. And so editors really hate that. Um, but that said, what I, what I can and do do is run particular facts or particular ideas by uh, researchers. And so I may, I may in fact run a quote by them to say, you know, here's what you said. I just want to be sure that this is correct. Because the other thing is that scientists are human and um, this happens sometimes people will misstate things in, in a story. And I've actually had it happen multiple times where I have to run a correction to a story because I, I, you know, perfectly quoted someone who misspoke. And so it is important. I mean, I understand the importance of running things by people, but uh, you know, the, the problem here is that we're not allowed to sort of give the subject, uh, you know, a say in how the, the story is done. Right. I think the other issue for, for me is a daily or hourly journalist is deadlines. I mean, I may be covering something live and then of course you don't have to hold on host while I go and call so-and-so and get uh, and, and fact check. So, so there's a real practical problem in daily journalism about uh, about fact checking. And sometimes scientists say, I'm, you know, I insist that you, you fact check and I, you can't publish your article until, until I've had a chance to review it. And, and I, and that's a non-starter because I can't have the 
the article can't be held hostage to to a scientist who may or may not actually make himself available for following up. But uh, but uh, but for when in, when NPR has more time uh, to uh, uh, and, and we're not on those super tight deadlines, we do there is there is extensive fact checking. But again, you also want to make sure that a scientist who doesn't come out looking good in an article is not the one who gets a chance to say, you know. Uh, oh, you you completely you know I disagree with my critics. You don't give me enough time. Blah 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 blah. You don't want you want you don't want to engage in those conversations. But at least what I can do on a on a daily basis is uh, if I have any questions or or uncertainties, I can I do try to reach out to somebody and say just double checking this or whatever. And so it does. So there's more of that that goes on perhaps than meets the eye. Uh, and I, I agree. In a, in a in a perfect world, uh, there would be even more. But uh, but we're under tremendous time pressure as well. I, I think um, calling and and focusing um, and our, um, a fact check on you know the parts of the article where a scientist has expertise, I think that makes a lot of sense. But sending an entire article to um, a scientist is much more likely to corrupt the process than to than to bring in meaningful corrections. I'm not saying that journalists don't make mistakes. Um, journalists definitely, definitely make mistakes. But um, um, I mean, it, it, you can you can imagine what would happen if if um, you know, you were sending your entire article to, um, you know, who's a credible, who's a politician that's generally trusted. I mean, if you were, if you were sent, if you sent an entire, if, if a political reporter did the same thing, you wouldn't trust that political reporter, right? It's, it's on the, it's, it's on the journalist to get the story right. And, and, um, and I think that's best done by focused fact checking, fo um, focusing on, um, the areas where you trust the the researcher. You often what I'll do is I'll call people back and I'll talk about their specific bits, and then I'll say, okay, and, and here's some other ideas that I've I've encountered just to see get a sense of of the consensus. But an entire article, there's too much um, too much scope for manipulation. And we're in our final minutes now, and we had the word reform someplace in the title of our panel. So I'd like to ask the panelists to give us in one or two sentences, the one thing that if you were controlling the universe and in charge of everything, you would change to improve science communication about issues of uncertainty faced with emergent science and an anxious public when we're in the middle of a pandemic. And I'm going to start with Richard. <laughs> Oh great! Uh, I, I wish there was a I wish there was a quick fix because I mean we've we've surfaced a whole lot of problems and there are other problems we haven't surfaced in this conversation. But I think uh, I think uh, we need to redouble our efforts to to convey what's uncertain. I, I very much like and I agree with and I try to to take on your suggestion that if it, if a study is in animals that we say it's in animals. And in fact, the journals that promote these studies are now uh, making sure that if that uh, if it's in an animal, that it's that it's it says that in the first sentence so people don't get too carried away and 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 start thinking about uh, uh, you know for, for their their press pitches. So people so the, that that's incredibly important context. I think we do that already we, we can and should do more. Uh, and uh, and I think we need to keep reminding people science is a process and not uh, and not answers falling from the heavens. Thank you, Manya. If I had a very, very powerful magic wand, it would be that individual readers paid attention to the sources that they were reading. Thank you, I, don't know how to do it. I would just make sure everyone reads the damn article. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, moderators prerogative, I would make journalists and science communicators more self-conscious about the language they use. I wish we did not have herd immunity conventionalized as the way to describe what should be called community immunity, because it doesn't much matter what the whole has. If you think the whole is the state of Pennsylvania and you're inside a community that has low vaccination, you've got a real problem. Community immunity makes more sense. It asks the question, what is the community? And you could move from communities to other communities in this course of the same day. The immunity level inside that community is what's going to affect you. With thanks to the organizers of this panel and to the three distinguished journalists, we wish you a very good day navigating the uncertainties of science and of our daily lives. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Okay. Bye.